Hello, this is Pastor Joe Vandenacker from Hantley Christian Reformed Church in Granville, Michigan. Welcome to our Christmas Day service of lessons and carols. As we come before the Lord, celebrating his gift of a Savior, let's begin by looking to him in prayer. Lord, you are king over all the earth. We glorify your holy name. We come before you and we give you thanks for all the rich blessings you have given to us. You have reconciled us to yourself. You have forgiven all our sins through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And you rule in our hearts, influencing our lives, shaping our character by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. In addition to that, Lord, you have filled our lives with rich blessings. On this Christmas day, we come before you, giving thanks for the way in which you have provided for us and praying for those who are poor, those who are destitute, those who do not have the means to purchase sufficient food, to provide the nutritional, provide for the nutritional needs of their children and of themselves. We give you thanks, O Lord, that even in the midst of a pandemic, we have wonderful health care resources available to us. And we pray for those throughout our nation and our world who do not have access to these. We pray for those regions where hospital beds are full, where ICUs have no more openings for new patients in need. We pray that this situation may soon improve. We come to you, Lord, and thank you for education, and teachers. And we pray for those for whom this year, with all the changes that it has brought, has produced fresh challenges, even struggles. We pray for those in our world who do not have the option available to them to receive such an education. We give you thanks for parents, grandparents, friends, and neighbors. We pray, bless them and keep them. We thank you that we can have the confidence that those who have gone before us, who have trusted in Jesus Christ their, as their Redeemer, now are with you in glory. And we pray that your Spirit may work in the hearts and lives of those in rebellion against you, who are living lives of defiant independence. We ask, O oh Lord, that they may come to see that there's no better life than a life ruled by you and lived under your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 3, 8 through 15. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God said to the man, Where are you? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals, and you will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. 
from Isaiah 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. from Luke 2. In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. This is the word of the Lord.
shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. This is the word of the Lord. No! 
Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let, let's, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning that what they had been told of them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed in what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 11. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, Where is this one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this news, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was born to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. And for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and they, the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. This is the word of the Lord. What does the birth of the Christ child mean to you? I suspect most often you gratefully think of Jesus Christ in personal terms as your Savior. You recall that the angel of the Lord instructed Joseph to name the child Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You know that Jesus atoned for your sin on the cross. Then what? Well, he returned home to heaven. There he is preparing a place for you. Perhaps this pretty much sums up what the birth of the Christ child means for you. To quote the message the angel brought to the shepherds, today 
town of David, a Savior has been born to you. The Christmas accounts in the Gospels and the vast majority of Christmas carols identify another title that this child rightly claims, another role he rightly fills in your life and in this entire world. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. We spur one another on, come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ, the newborn king. We enthusiastically sing joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. The location of his birth is very relevant. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Magi from the east arrive in Jerusalem, inquiring, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? The current king ruling over Judea, King Herod, turns to the Jewish priests and urgently inquires, Where do the prophets say the Christ is to be born? The Christ. The name Jesus identifies the birth of your Savior. Yet there's more to the angel's message also. He is Christ, the Lord. Christ identifies this boy child of Mary as the long-awaited Messiah, a king. He's not just any king. This is the Christ. To use the Greek language in which the New Testament was written, the Hebrew equivalent is Messiah. In English, these words mean the anointed one. The king was officially appointed as heir to the throne by being anointed by the pouring of sweet-smelling oil over his head. What does it mean to you that your Savior is also your king? You live in a democratic republic and you live here at a time when people are quicker to challenge those in authority than they are to obey them. At a time when to take a knee symbolizes disagreement with, rather than allegiance to, your country. You may well be of a mind to think that God should have been consulted with Mary and not simply come to her with an overwhelming display of glory and power to inform her that she was privileged to serve him by bearing and giving birth to his son. How well do you relate to Christ as your king how inclined are you to joyfully greet the birth of the one who will tell you what you may and may not do with your own body? Who will set the parameters for who you may and may not marry? Establish the major priorities that you are to pursue in your life, his kingdom priorities, and perhaps even issue a compelling call to you to serve him in some way that you find you don't really feel free to turn down. Have you grasped what it means that the one who saves you from the tyranny of the devil is the one who will then rule over your life? Have you accepted that truth? Willingly and gladly. In the town of David, King David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, whom you are to call my Lord. He is the King before whom you are to humbly bow and to whom you are to willingly, even, re even eagerly reply, I am your willing servant. Do you realize what you're saying when you sing glory to the newborn king? 
When it comes to matters of spiritual and moral significance, democratic self-rule, it's simply not an option. You will live under the dominion, the dominant influence of one of two kingdoms. The one is a rebel kingdom, defined by its opposition to God and its defiance of submission to his rule. If you are of the rebel sort, you will start out feeling as free as a lark, but you'll quickly find you're living under the enslaving influence of a tyrant. Your other choice is to live as a devoted member of the kingdom that God ruined, in which God reigns. He will be your sovereign Lord, which means in everyday terms, he will have the final word. His will is final. His ways are good. As a down-to-earth, everyday example of the core values held in the kingdom of rebels, I submit to you the sinful, self-serving tyrant, King Herod the Great. He was king in Judea, but over him was the world's king of kings, the emperor the supreme ruler of the world surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, Caesar Augustus. Caesar had appointed Herod as king over the politically restless region of Judea. Rome's enduring success as an empire was largely due to its brutal suppression of any and all opposition, so King Herod fit in quite well. It's hard to imagine a sharper contrast than the one we find between the child, the Magi came to visit, and the ruling king of the land, King Herod. The forces of evil in the spiritual realms knew how to cause great evil to come forth from King Herod's weaknesses. To avoid confusion, I should mention that there were several Herods, all of them members of the same royal dynasty. The Herod in power when Jesus was born, ironically is known to historians as Herod the Great. Christians are inclined to think he would have been better assigned the title Herod the Horrible. In reality, he was both a man of great accomplishments and horrific atrocities. Great leaders often are either idolized or demonized, depending on your perspective. Truth is, only Satan is pure evil. And only God is pure goodness. We humans all have within us a degree of both. Herod the Great earned that title from the great building projects he successfully completed during his reign. He is known for building elaborate fortresses, stately palaces, huge amphitheaters, and magnificent monuments. Seeking to win the favor of his superiors in Rome, Herod built an entirely new city, and he named it Caesarea. It was built largely of imported marble. And it was famous for a huge man-made man harbor dug out in order to welcome ships coming from Rome. Seeking also to curry the support and cooperation, Herod commissioned the rebuilding of the Jewish temple, which had been in ruin since Rome's invasion and conquest of Jerusalem. The magnitude of these building projects was matched only by a ruthlessness comparable to that of modern dictators like Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, and Saddam Hussein. For a person who held such great power, Herod felt terribly insecure. 
He had gained power and he stayed in power through a reign of terror. He put to death anyone he saw as a threat to his throne. One of his first acts when Rome appointed him king over Judea was to execute 45 of the 70 religious leaders on the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. Every one of them who had spoken out publicly in opposition to his appointment. Throughout the course of his reign, he grew suspicious of and put to death three of his sons, his wife, his mother-in-law, his brother-in-law, an uncle, and even an old friend and influential supporter who had helped him become appointed as king. Herod was a cruel, self-serving ruler. He deserved the nickname he was given, Herod the Fox. Before the Magi arrive in the town of Bethlehem, they, and we with them, are introduced to the newborn king through the prophecy of Micah. The chief priests recite his prophetic words to Herod, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Now, who would you rather have for a king, the fox or the shepherd? From the day that Samuel anointed that young shepherd named David, the son of Jesse, grandson of Obed, great-grandson of Ruth and Boaz, shepherd king. That came to be embraced as a fitting description of the type of king God was. And the type of king whom God desired to rule over his chosen people on his behalf. Abraham and his descendants had experienced the Lord, their God and king, to be a powerful sovereign who faithfully provided, protected, and delivered his people from their enemies. David famously embraced the Lord as the strong, caring shepherd of Israel. Kings who ruled under God and as his servants, kings like David, were expected to use their authority and their God-given strengths to serve the good of the nation. Contrast that to the way that the kings of the world typically use their power and the resources at their disposal. In the eyes of the world, people who are lesser and lower in status are here to serve those in society who hold privileged positions of power and wealth, positions acquired by virtue of royal birth or ruthless conquest, or perhaps simply by virtue of their male gender. God, our shepherd king, shows that this worldly view of power is terribly twisted. It turns things inside out and upside down. This evil perversion is in direct opposition to his own excellent and praiseworthy use of his stupendous power and astounding resourcefulness in order to share what he has with others. A tyrannical ruler squeezes the poor and the powerless. He squeezes out of them every last penny and every ounce of labor that he can wring from them. A godly shepherd king, on the other hand, gives his all for the good of the sheep. He fights off predators, searches out green pastures, and goes ahead of his sheep to ensure that their watering places are safe, free from danger. He does not seek to be served, but to serve. In fact, he's thoroughly convinced that it's great to serve. He believes he can do no greater good 
than to bring good into the lives of others. King David, with the exception of one very well-known and very serious moral lapse, King David was a ruler who shared God's heart for his people. David fought Israel's battles. He professed his love for God's laws and made them known all throughout the land. He poured out his heart to God in the Psalms that became a vital part of the worship of the Lord at the tabernacle. The tabernacle he had located in Jerusalem. It should come as no surprise then that after experiencing one religiously unfaithful and self-serving ruler after God's over God's people after another, the prophet Micah was instructed by God to tell the faithful remnant in Israel this promising news. God would once again raise up a ruler from Bethlehem who would reign as a shepherd over God's people. In their search for this newborn king, following the light that God had given to them, the Magi quite naturally stop at the palace of King Herod. No one who knew Herod would have described him as a shepherd of God's people Israel. Butcher, maybe. Shepherd, not a chance. Herod was the fox who preyed on the sheep. Herod's number one priority was Herod. He was out to protect his position of power and authority and to enjoy the luxurious palaces he had built for his comfort and his glory. Who will you have rule over you? Will you live as Herod did under the tyranny of the devil? Or will you willingly, gladly submit your life to the rule of the Son of God, who out of his unfathomable goodness emptied himself of his privileged status as the Son of God to become one of us in order to redeem us, deliver us from the tyranny of sin, and be our shepherd king, now and forever. True to our day, you may be inclined to answer, neither of the above. I will make of myself and my life whatever I choose. I'll have a great life. And if not, if things get real bad, I'll simply bring it to an end. Take another look. That choice is one that already has the devil's imprint all over it. For a great life and a great future, you can do no better than to give your life to the all-powerful, supremely good king who gave his life for us. Follow in the footsteps of the Magi. Go where God is guiding you. Humbly kneel before your Savior and King. You can do no better than to entrust your life to Him, who is supremely great and overwhelmingly good. Amen.
I am reading from John 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Of God, children born, not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. I wish you God's blessings on this Christmas day, this day when we celebrate the birth of our Savior and King. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>